Welcome to Physician Focus, a program brought to you by the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Donna Norris, a psychiatrist practicing in Wellesley. I'm here because winter is coming. Many of us in Massachusetts don't feel so great about that. Winter brings short days, shoveling snow, slipping on sidewalks, the difficulty of getting around to make our appointments and to see our friends. It's not surprising that many of us feel the winter blues. In today's episode, we're looking at simple ways to help ourselves, our families, and our neighbors stay safe and well through the cold and blizzards. Some of the hazards of winter aren't obvious. Did you know that every year in the United States, 20,000 people come to the emergency rooms with unintentional carbon monoxide poisoning? Most of those poisonings happen in the winter in our own homes. Our children and elderly people are most vulnerable. There are other ways that winter can be especially rough as we get older. In this episode, we'll learn simple steps to make winter better and safer for all of us. First, our correspondent, Kate Connors, from the Massachusetts Medical Society, met with Dr. Theodore McNell, a pediatrician working in the emergency room at the University of Massachusetts Memorial Medical Center, who's done a lot of work on understanding how carbon monoxide poisonings happen. He is here to tell us how to stay warm through the winter the safe way. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. McNell, you're an expert in carbon monoxide poisoning. Can you start off by telling us what is carbon monoxide and what makes it dangerous? Sure, so carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas. It's completely indetectable to our senses, so it's tasteless, it's odorless, it's colorless. It's made by a lot of the things that we have in our homes. So basically when fossil fuels don't burn cleanly, they can make carbon monoxide as a byproduct. And this can be th from things such as gas or oil-powered heat, from our gas stoves, our gas dryers, our fireplaces, our wood-burning stoves, automobiles, pretty much anything that uses fuel in our homes. And so is this why it's especially dangerous or something we should be worried about during the winter? Absolutely. So carbon monoxide can affect anybody, rich, poor. We all have these things in our house. During winter, we tend to utilize them more. So we use gas-powered heat. If the power goes out from a snowstorm, maybe we're using a gas-powered electric generator. We're cooking more inside with our gas-powered stoves. We're using our fireplaces. So winter definitely presents a hazard for carbon monoxide poisoning. How common is carbon monoxide poisoning, especially here in New England? So it, it's common. It, it represents about 20,000 ER visits in the United States a year, and that's just unintentional carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, kids, about 5,000 kids visit the emergency department each year in the U.S. for carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide poisoning clearly can affect the whole family. Are there certain members of your family who might be more susceptible to it? I'd say there's two populations especially at risk, and, and it's children and the elderly. So uh, children are at risk because they may accumulate carbon monoxide faster than adults. They actually breathe faster than adults. Mm -hmm. And a child may not be able to vocalize or recognize that he's having symptoms uh, or may not be able to get away from the source of exposure if they can't walk or you know the parents don't tell them to, to get away from whatever the exposure is. Mm -hmm. I, I think elderly are also at risk because they also may not recognize symptoms. They may be alone uh, and they too may not be able to escape the source of exposure. And so you know, as opposed to a family where multiple family members are sick and it's recognized and they all exit the house, an elderly person may be at home alone just not feeling well. How does carbon monoxide poisoning happen and what symptoms should people look for? So carbon monoxide poisoning happens when something goes wrong with our equipment that is not burning that fossil fuel efficiently. Uh, so it can be subtle. It doesn't necessarily have an explosion or, or some harbinger that something's gone wrong. And because it's indetectable, we, we may not know uh, that the carbon monoxide is in this room here with us today. The, the symptoms that we experience, so the most common are headache, nausea, and vomiting. But it, it can be a broad range of symptoms, and it can affect different people in the family differently. So some people may get the headache, some people the nausea. You can get dizzy, you can get short of breath. In babies, they can become irritable or they can become lethargic. Another symptom of carbon monoxide poisoning may be that our pets are acting funny. So sometimes if you have a dog or a cat, they may experience the symptoms before other people in the family. And so these are all things to watch for. 
Some of these symptoms are pretty common on their own. How can someone perhaps evaluate whether the symptoms they're experiencing might be associated with carbon monoxide poisoning or they're just not feeling well that day? The symptoms are uh, wide ranging, but if you have a lot of people in a room experiencing symptoms out of nowhere, that suggests there's something in the room that's causing them. Uh, these symptoms in the absence of a fever, so uh, carbon monoxide doesn't cause a fever like viruses do that cause these similar symptoms. Uh, I'd say the other thing is just be aware of carbon monoxide because the treatment is so easy, which is get out of the room, that better to get out of the room than figure out what's causing the symptoms rather than stay there and try to think about whether you're being poisoned in that moment. Get out of the room and bring the pets. Yes, bring the pets and, and children too. <laughs> How can we avoid carbon monoxide poisoning if it's all around us? So uh, the first thing to do would be to try to prevent carbon monoxide from being in your home. And so that would include maintaining your heating system well, having it checked annually by a professional to make sure that it's burning efficiently. Um, it would involve placing carbon monoxide detectors in your house in the appropriate places. So carbon monoxide detectors should be at least on every level of your house. They should be within, every, uh, within 15 feet of every bedroom door in your garage if the garage is a part of your house and make sure that you know, once a month you're checking it, make sure it's functioning, that the batteries aren't dead um, because pre prevention and detection would be the two most important factors. Mm -hmm. If the alarm goes off, what should people do? So the first uh, and most important thing I would say to do is don't ignore it. I, I have seen cases in the ER where you know, an alarm goes off, you don't smell anything, this must be a, a spurious alarm, you turn it off and then you're getting poisoned. Um, so first thing would be don't ignore it. I'd say get out of the house. If you're able to, open a window, ideally from outside of your home. That way you let the carbon monoxide out of your home. And contact the fire department, because the fire department will come. They have special equipment to figure out where that carbon monoxide may be coming from. What if people say, I don't have gas heat in my home? Are they still at risk? Uh, if they don't have gas heat, that, that is certainly one of the major exposures for carbon monoxide. But oil heat is, gas-powered stoves, wood-burning fireplaces. Um, uh, there are many potential exposures, so it's rare to find a home that doesn't have at least one potential source of carbon monoxide. Okay. What about when people are in their car? Is there anything dangerous in terms of carbon monoxide poisoning in their cars? Sure. So the, the car is, uh, unless you have a purely electric car, uh, which unfortunately is rare these days, <laughs> um, there's a potential source with the gasoline engine that's burning. And so, uh, First, you should never have a car operating in an enclosed space, so don't let your car warm up in the garage that's closed. That can start to accumulate carbon monoxide, especially here in the winter in New England as we're digging out our cars from the feet of snow that are surrounding it. Shovel out the exhaust system first. That way you're not blocking the carbon monoxide from exiting the car if you're then going to turn it on to idle it. And if you're shoveling out your car, don't let your children sit in the nice warm car while you're shoveling it out because uh, they could be getting poisoned in that, in that car. How, as a physician, how do you treat carbon monoxide poisoning? So uh, most important way is first get away from the carbon monoxide. So fortunately, by the time people have come to me, we don't have carbon monoxide in the ER. Um, and then it's a very basic treatment, which is oxygen. And so by giving oxygen, we help the body get rid of the carbon monoxide sooner. And we'll keep them in the ER, giving them oxygen until their levels are back in a normal range and until people have no symptoms of poisoning. And does it have any long-term consequences? Typically, no. Uh, rarely, more in adults than kids, they can have some neurologic symptoms much later after a very severe poisoning. But generally, by treating it adequately at the time, it, it, you shouldn't have symptoms. Okay. You're an emergency physician. What makes you interested in carbon monoxide poisoning, and how did you learn so much about it? <laughs> So um, when I was in high school, uh, I played ice hockey, I still do, uh, and the goalie for our team actually got carbon monoxide from an uh, ice resurfacer, what we, some people may call a Zamboni, um, idling in the rink. And so that got me interested in whether ice resurfacers can be a possible source of exposure to carbon monoxide. So in fellowship, I did a research project where I compared youth ice hockey players at rinks that use electric-powered ice resurfacers compared to rinks that use fossil fuel-powered ice resurfacers. And I found that the kids who are playing ice hockey in the ranks with fossil fuel powered ice resurfacers have higher levels of carbon monoxide in their blood uh, compared to the ranks with the electric ice resurfacers. Um, and you know, it's sort of a battle for ice rinks because they, they don't want to ventilate a lot because you want a low level of humidity and you want it to be really chilly in the building so that the ice stays well. But unfortunately, that's always 
battling against getting the carbon monoxide you know, circulating out of the rink air. Well, we're in Massachusetts. A lot of kids play ice hockey here. Should parents be worried? So we are lucky to live in one of the most progressive states in the country. And in Massachusetts, there are a lot of laws regulating if a rink were to have a fossil fuel powered ice resurfacer. Uh, and the laws are so strict. And then there are also um, benefits to rinks that use electric powered ice resurfacers that most of the ice rinks here in Massachusetts have electric resurfacers. But that's sort of the exception to the rule across the country. Well, that's great news here. Dr. Theodore Macnow, thank you so much for being here today. Hopefully, none of our viewers will have to visit you this winter. Yes, please don't come see me at work. You know, I think the, the bottom line is that this, this is a potential danger for everybody, but with following a few simple steps, you can keep your family safe. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's clear that we need to be careful about winter basics like heating our homes and shoveling our cars. Living with snow and ice is especially difficult as we get older. To learn more, Kate Connors met with two physicians who support elderly people in different Massachusetts communities. These doctors are very familiar with the ways that winter can make health problems worse and also create new ones, especially through our retirement years. Dr. Shrikant Vasudev practices in rural western Massachusetts, and Dr. Susan Monahan works with outpatients on the North Shore. They tell us how, with simple planning and preparation, we can make winter safer for ourselves and for others. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Shrikant Vazadev from Bay State Medical Center and Dr. Susan Moynihan from North Shore Physicians Group. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us. As we all know, winter can be a difficult time for the members of the elderly community around us. However, planning ahead for winter can help all of us, especially our elderly neighbors, stay healthier and safer. When we plan ahead, we're more likely to make it through winter. Can you tell us how does winter specifically impact uh, patients who have chronic health conditions. Dr. Vazadev? As an inpatient doctor, I see a lot of exacerbations of chronic conditions, especially heart failure, COPD, asthma, uh, in our elderly populations, mostly because of our uh, winter-related illnesses, including the flu season, the, uh, the respiratory illnesses, which tend, to, which tend to be a lot more severe in our elderly population because of dwindling immunity and presence of chronic medical conditions. Hence, we do see a lot of exacerbations of these conditions as an inpatient. We're really concerned that we make sure that all of our patients who have chronic conditions or who are over the age of 65 understand how important it is to get a flu shot every year. Uh, it is the single most important thing they can do to protect their health in the winter. Making sure they're also immunized against pneumonia, the standard pneumonia vaccines, is, is important as well. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to think about or to conceive of, but still in the United States, probably on the order of 30 to 40,000 people die every year from influenza or the complications of influenza, the majority of those who experience serious illness and, and die of it are over 65 or under the age of two. So Dr. Moynihan, other than infectious diseases, are there other conditions that might appear during winter among the elderly population? Certainly the strains of winter activities can bring on exacerbations of chronic problems. People who have heart disease are sometimes uh, uh, afraid to shovel. We know that arm work is harder on the heart than um, leg work, and we know that we're also not accustomed to the repetitive motion of shoveling. In the cold, uh, there's more vasoconstriction, so patients with heart disease might experience angina or heart pains while shoveling. It's an important thing to think of because even if you're feeling very well the rest of the time, that is a vulnerable, it is an activity that can make you vulnerable. Interesting. Dr. Vazadev, do you see this with your patients as I do. Well? I do see a lot of patients, especially the elderly patients presenting with angina or worsening of their heart failure symptoms while shoveling snow, and especially falls. I would like to touch on falls, especially in the elderly population, because uh, they, are, they are more prone to osteoporosis, they are more prone to broken bones, and a hip fracture in an elderly can, can sometimes be a terminal event, hence fall prevention is essential in our elderly population. I guess uh, 
some of the few things I would highly recommend is to always carry your cell phone around, have a plan in case you fall, and a lot of a lot of uh, name brand uh, products for uh, like the Life Alert or Lifeline, which prevent them, uh, which help them seek help if they do fall, are essential in preventing uh, further mortality or morbidity from falls. I think you could probably speak to this more than I can, but you know, a fall where you get help within an hour or two is a much less serious fall than a fall where you have been lying either out in the cold or on the floor for a number of hours. There are many illnesses that compound your fracture if, you're, if you don't get help promptly. So that's a very important point. Yeah. It sounds like all of us can think about steps that we can take to avoid falls during winter. Falls during winter are, can be uh, can never be fully prevented, but there are many things we can do um, to prevent falls, including staying strong, walking, and um, maintaining muscle strength. Both really improve our balance. The theory of fall prevention rests on the idea that we don't necessarily lose our balance more often as we age, but we our ability to catch ourselves when we're about to fall changes. And you can actually strengthen your ability to catch yourself before you actually hit the ground if you walk regularly and that helps maintain your balance and your leg strength. But if you also do something to maintain your core strength and your upper body strength, muscle mass um, really does help quite a bit. Studies have shown that even very minor uh, or you know, what people might think of as fairly light exercise can really be helpful. Our local council on aging and many across the state offer classes for, they call it osteoarthritis prevention, osteoporosis prevention. But I think one of the major purposes of those classes really is that uh, patients are actually working all the muscles of their body, often in a very safe environment, often with a simple chair exercise. Uh, and they are strengthening their muscles and they're probably uh, very much affecting their risk of falling and improving their risk. I can't stress this enough, but being in a graded exercise program really helps, not just with fall prevention, but your general health helps with your chronic medical conditions, including hypertension and diabetes and heart failure. Being in a graded exercise program is shown to improve uh, uh, results with medical treatment in addition to just the medical treatment, so I think it's important that uh, being in a uh, working with the Y or your local um, exercise programs is essential to prevent falls and for your general health. So, Dr. Vazadev, exercise is important. Mm -hmm. What about diet and nutrition for seniors? Diet and nutrition. Well, uh, we are what we eat, and it's it's essential that you concentrate on your diet, especially during the winter time, uh, during times of food scarcity. Uh, uh, our seniors tend to live on frozen or canned foods, which tend to be high in sodium content, especially if you have high blood pressure or heart failure. That may not be a good idea because it can cause worsening, it can cause fluid retention, and can cause worsening of your heart failure or your high blood pressure. We do see, especially around the snowstorm times, we do see people stock up on canned food. I would recommend reading the nutrition labels, talking to your doctor or your nutritionist about your sodium intake and limiting yourself to fresh foods or canned foods or having a way to obtain fresh foods even during a storm if you have no way of getting around. Dr. Moynihan, are there any resources that you often point your patients to in order to be able to access those fresh healthy foods? It's always important to understand in your community where the resources lie. A lot of primary care offices like mine have care managers and social workers that can help you access services in your community. And in my community and many communities across the state, the Council on Aging is also a catchment facility that can lead you to all the community resources, resources that can help with um, uh, obtaining uh, Meals on Wheels, uh, services to help uh, people have access to food pantries, people with food insecurity. Uh, those things can be very helpful. In addition, they are usually uh, the organizers or can serve as a nidus for local transportation resources. There are many, many resources that patients can take advantage of in, in all of the communities across the state, uh, both the well-to-do communities as well as those that um, have more economic challenges. And all of those 
can be accessed through 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 the Council on Aging, I would say is the primary, but in our community, it would be North Shore Elder Services or Greater Lynn Commun Community, uh, 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 Greater Lynn Senior Services. But every community will have an organization like that that's responsible for organizing assistance. And you're in Western Mass. You have similar resources. We do. We do have resources. There is a life path for elder care, and there are a lot of other local towns which have their individual councils on aging, which also provide uh, resources. And interestingly, a lot of grocery stores have their own transportation available in Western Mass for elderly people. They can pick them up. Uh, they they go to assisted living facilities, uh, senior living facilities. They pick them up and they help them with their shopping and then drop them right back if transportation is a problem. So we talked about how to stay safe and healthy outside, but as we all know, it gets cold here in the winter. How, what, why does it matter that our elderly neighbors are able to stay warm inside during the winter? Uh, I think the most important thing is having a plan. Uh, a lot of our elders live by themselves. They do not have people to check on. So if you have any elderly neighbors, definitely do check on them and periodically check with them if they need anything. And there are a lot of resources available with uh, heating, especially hypothermia is a very common uh, complaint. Uh, for our elderly patients and there are a lot of resources through our electric and gas companies also which offer plans for seniors at much discounted rates than what you would usually pay for. I'm sure Susan has looked at resources for those and she would be mm. happy to share those. You can work through any elder services or senior services organization to get a discounted rate for utilities um, and Citizens Energy is the Massachusetts brainchild of Joe Kennedy uh, that offers free heating oil to anybody who has a need elderly or not and um, they provide uh, literally millions of gall gallons of fuel every winter for people who can't afford to heat their homes. It is really important in the event of a power outage to check on any elderly neighbors. We, the few cases of hypothermia that I've presided over um, this past couple of winters have occurred with patients living alone whose relatives uh, lived far away. They weren't aware that we had a small local power outage with a, you know, a single a single or several telephone poles down, everybody lost their utilities and heat, and he was, you know, home alone and have, uh, uh, you know, went to bed at night and his heat went off and um, nobody noticed until the following morning when he didn't come out to pick up his newspaper mm -hmm. that um, something had happened. But we all lost our heat and utilities. Any one of us could have checked on him. We just it wasn't in the forefront of our mind, unfortunately. I think people would be shocked to even consider that you could get hypothermia inside. Okay. It, you can get hypothermia inside, and and it and it's um, it's very insidious because initially you're very uncomfortable, and you're cold. But after a time, you 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 just lose your ability uh, to perceive that you're getting colder and colder. And if you're asleep, or again if you're elderly, you may not be able to get help at that point. Yeah. You may not be capable of picking up the phone at that point. You may be confused. Interesting. Which is again one of the reasons why the emergency buttons or the, like the life alert really come in handy. Always carry a cell phone with you. Uh, almost everyone has a cell phone now and have a couple of people that you think would help you on speed dial in case you need them. And uh, always, uh, hand crank radios are always a good, uh, good idea. A disaster preparedness kit would obviously go a long way in improving your survival in the winter. So when we talk about creating a plan for winter, what do you recommend to your patients that such a plan would look like? Dr. Moynihan? Well, starting out by making sure you're immunized against flu, um, making sure that you have um, a plan to get shoveled out in the case of a storm. If you plan to do it yourself, you're going to want to make sure you take it slow, use a broom, don't use a shovel, small mm -hmm. shovel loads, wear the proper footwear, buy a pair of boots with a really sturdy sole. If you really feel like you're gonna do a lot of shoveling or you have stairs that you're gonna be negotiating up and down trying to clear snow from your property, it's a good idea to get, they, they make cleats and grips that you can, um, uh, that come on a stretchy, um, a band that you can put on the bottom of your boots to add extra traction. If you feel you're gonna be negotiating ice and snow frequently, those can be a real help. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, put into place a system of checks. Anybody who really lives alone, and this applies probably to anyone, not just somebody who's uh, elderly, you should always have a plan to check on each other, and especially in the event of a power failure. Especially in the situation that I was in, the, the, the little local power failure. Nobody knew that there was a power failure except the two streets on which it occurred. Mm -hmm. um, those are good things to have in place. And, and, and always a, a, a sense of what you would use for transportation if you ever uh, weren't able to transport yourself, if you couldn't get your car out. What would you do in an emergency or a semi-urgent situation if you had to get out of your house and it wasn't an, a situation where you were, felt comfortable calling an ambulance? How would you get out? Who would you call? How would you clear your stairs? How would you get, it, who would you use for transportation and how would you get to that transportation? Those are all good things to think about. And we do, we do check on our elders in our community in Western Mass. We have a list of at-risk elders, especially people who present to the hospital with with reasons where they, they would have been a lot better had they had any help. We do have our at-risk elders, we do have social workers and case managers checking on them periodically, either with a phone call or actually visiting their houses and seeing if they're doing okay and if they need any kind of resources or help, we do, we do provide those services. That's wonderful. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation. Thank you both for your time. I think what we all learned today is that when it comes to taking care of our elderly neighbors, it's really the community that makes a really big difference. Oh, for sure. It is. It is. Most of us work to put ourselves out of business, but it is in the health of <laughs> it is in the interest of the health of the community that we do what we do. Wonderful. Dr. Fazadev, Dr. Mornihan, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you for having us. No question, winter feels tough at times, but as we've seen, we can reduce our risk of seasonal illness and accidents. After this show, please go check the batteries in your carbon monoxide alarms. Take an hour or two to figure out what you or your elderly parents or neighbors might need. Maybe you could fit those snow boots with cleats or grips for walking on ice. You may need to check out community resources like transport and help with heating costs. You or someone else may need help getting to medical appointments and picking up groceries or medicines. When we plan ahead, we're more likely to have a safer, healthier winter. Thank you to Drs. Ted Macknell, Dr. Shrivkant Vasudev, and Dr. Susan Monahan. I'm Dr. Donna Norris, and on behalf of the Massachusetts Medical Society, thank you for tuning in to Physician Focus. Every winter in New England, we have an increase in cases of carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a gas that's indetectable to our senses and can make you very sick or even kill you in a short period of time. Fortunately, carbon monoxide poisoning is entirely preventable. Ensure that you have your heating system and other home equipment maintained and inspected annually. Never operate gas-powered equipment indoors and never barbecue indoors. Make sure to have working carbon monoxide alarms on every floor of your house and within 15 feet of every bedroom door. They should be tested monthly. When snow falls, take care to make sure that chimneys, heating and dryer outlets are clear of snow so that exhaust can exit. Similarly, shovel out your car's exhaust and never allow children or other people to sit in an idle car while you're shoveling it out. If your carbon monoxide alarm ever goes off, don't ignore it. Exit your house and call the fire department. By following these steps, you can protect your family this winter. Do you find yourself feeling down in winter? Or if you experience depression through the year, does it get worse in the colder and darker months? I'm here to tell you about winter depression and what you can do that may be helpful. Seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, is a type of depression that tends to occur in the fall. You may lose your energy and motivation. You may feel sluggish, agitated, distracted, hopeless, and you may have problems with sleeping, your appetite, or suicidal thoughts. SAD can lead to social withdrawal, problems with school or work, and substance abuse. Here's the good news. You can talk with your primary care physician, your psychiatrist, or mental health professional. There are effective treatments such as counseling, light box therapy, or medication. Sometimes we feel bad in the fall and winter anyway, especially during the holidays. 
But if a mood slump continues for days or weeks, don't wait. Talk with your doctor or counselor for more information and support.